السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا بفضلك علمه نرحب بكم جميعا معكم محمد مصطفى محمود This is uh, uh, welcome everybody to this session which is organized by Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship uh, I, will, I, am, I will be your host tonight. My name is Muhammad Mustafa Mahmoud. For short, they call me Dr. 3M. And uh, to, tonight's webinar is, uh, uh, will be delivered by our uh, respected colleague, Dr. Najib Azhar. Uh, the title will be Managing Vital Technologies for Rapid Response in Healthcare Crisis. And tonight, by the way, is the, our second uh, session in, in, in a series of healthcare, uh, you know, technology in healthcare. This is the list of uh, last week, last Friday, exactly this time. We had engineer Tariq Hakim speaking about healthcare uh, and in data, healthcare data governance. Tonight we have Professor Najib Azhar, and we have the list, you know, the whole for the coming two months. We will be having a series of webinars. We will keep you posted and updated. I would like in the beginning to thank our strategic partners, both Digitum and Tip.com. Digitum is a leading technology organization in Saudi Arabia, which is doing state-of-the-art IT application and digital applications, not only in the area of healthcare, but in, in, in many other areas like education and so on. Tip.com is an online medical community, which is uh, the build state of the art virtual clinics. And uh, they will be uh, our host, our sponsor for the upcoming uh, uh, events. Uh, let me quickly introduce Dr. Najib Azhar. In fact, now I was wondering how long ago I knew him. It's almost 40 years ago, 40 years ago, 40. We met uh, at uh, Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, United States, where both of us were studying. Uh, Dr. Najib Azhar now, he lives in the Silicon Valley in the United States. It's uh, very early for him now. He's the CEO of Aztec Technologies, healthcare technology consultants, visiting professor in biomedical engineering technology at DeVry University. Uh, Dr. Najib Azhar is an eminent biomedical engineer based on the Silicon Valley, as I mentioned, he has a PhD in biomedical engineering from Drexel University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Also, he has a master's in bioengineering from Pennsylvania State University and certificate in medical device product development from University of California, Irvine in the United States. This is just a short uh, summary that we did for maybe four or five full pages. He possesses unique repertoire of expertise and experience in diverse aspects of the medical device and healthcare industries, comprehensive technical expertise and experience in design, use and maintenance of medical devices, training engineers and clinical staff on medical technologies, in-depth knowledge and experience in quality management system, regulatory requirements for medical devices, marketing of medical devices and business development in the healthcare industry, equipment need assessment, preparing request for quotation or RFB as we call them here, for meeting industrial objectives. He's a recognized global standards for medical devices, including risk analysis and risk management. He has served as advisor and consultant to various ministers of health, like in Kuwait, medical equipment consultants to the World Bank Healthcare Projects, co-editor of the World Health Organization Journal, World Health Equipment Management, and the Dean of Biomedical Engineering at Barrett Hodgson University. Very rich experience, very specialized in this field, which is not many people are, uh, you know, are experts in such field. We're very happy to welcome him in our uh, tonight session, in our series of uh, uh, e-healthcare. Uh, uh, and uh, 
The webinar is supposed to last the whole event for one hour. We started exactly at eight o'clock. We hope exactly to finish at nine o'clock, inshallah. Uh, if you have any questions to the speaker, you can post them at the chat, not at the question and answer. And please direct your question to the moderators, not to, to everybody. So uh, during the presentation or at the end of the presentation, Dr. Najib will go through your questions and they try, inshallah, uh, to answer them within the time frame. I don't like usually to take much time from the presenter. So I would like to invite Dr. Najib Azhar to take control of the presentation and start to share his presentation from his side. Welcome, Dr. Najib. Uh, we welcome you from Medina and Munawara. And it's a long distance and it's a wonder what technologies are doing today that connecting us. The floor is yours. We can see your presentation now. So, um, um, today, um, like the title, like Dr. Freeham introduced, Managing Vital Technologies for Rapid Response in Healthcare Crisis. And this is actually a subject that I will be introducing about what is called resilient healthcare. So, um, okay. um, that is the mile HPH05 that I guess we all are looking forward to. Um, so let me introduce the key learning objectives that we will have in today's uh, webinar. The key learning objectives are actually in three different areas as I will be presenting right now. And and they are in the area of healthcare technologies. And then we will talk specifically about healthcare crises. As we all know that technologies are becoming more and more important, but in crises, in healthcare crises in particular, the importance increases in uh, some other directions as I will present. And then finally, we will be talking about resilience and resilience healthcare or resilient healthcare. So under healthcare technologies, our objectives will be defining the various categories of technologies. What are their contributions, advantages, and possible hazards of these technologies? And then why is it important to understand the working principles of these technologies? And finally, the giving appropriate and adequate training in these technologies. Then we will move on to the subject of healthcare crises, and we will be talking about or defining what classifies as a healthcare crisis, and of course, crises being the plural. What are the additional factors that come into play when there is a crisis? What are the challenges when the unexpected happens, as we all have been through that in an epidemic and a pandemic? Under resilience, we will be talking about the concept of safety one and safety two, which are um, differ in some aspects. We will be talking about what is resilience. And then we will be going into two tools that are for planning for unexpected, which is the resilience analysis grid and the functional resonance analysis method. Incidentally, these maybe overwhelming terms, but I will just be doing the introduction to the concept of them. Um, it's a whole new subject that uh, everybody is looking into now, uh, particularly in the healthcare field. And then finally, we'll be talking about what is resilience engineering and resilient healthcare. Resilient healthcare is nothing but the application of resilience engineering tools like RAG and FRAM to plan in healthcare. So just giving you a, a brief idea, we are these are the three areas that we will be uh, So these are the three areas that we will be looking at. And uh, let me proceed now to that. 
next to the laser pointer, there is arrows. You can use the arrows in the menu in the bottom left to move from one slide to the other. Uh, bottom left. I don't see that. Anyway, um, this should work. Yes. Okay, so in the area of healthcare technologies, uh, talking about the, the various uh, contributions and advantages. So healthcare technologies being used currently can be divided into four main areas. The medical device technologies, the information technology, data science, and epidemiology. As we all know that um, information te uh, technology has different applications all over, but in particular, uh, data science and epidemiology uh, are important in the healthcare field. Then we will be, um, we can classify um, the artificial intelligence, which includes machine and deep learning technologies, and finally, uh, biotechnology and biostatistics. So these are the four main areas of technologies being used in healthcare. Uh, I have a little definition for each of them, and then we will be going into their detail. So information technology is used for monitoring and analysis of the spread of disease or any disaster being the crisis, because we will be focusing on healthcare crises. Crises. So AI has these applications and biotechnology, again, is used for evaluating data and clinical trials. So I'll be going into a short explanation or factors of each one of these as we go forward. So medical technology is the first part. Medical devices can be mainly classified into diagnostic monitoring and therapeutic devices. And then there's sub-classifications, which is IVDs, biosignals, instrumentation, active implantable devices, and prosthetic or assistive devices. So these devices uh, we know are always in use, uh, but I will ask the participants a question that, um, what do you think was and is the most critical therapeutic medical device uh, in the recent pandemic for severe COVID-19 patients in ICUs. Um, and if um, the panelist could, could read any responses from the chat, what is the most severe, um, what is the most critical device therapeutic for severe COVID patients? Uh, we have several answered ventilators. Pardon? Okay. So Vent that's the part. Yeah, keep a note of that. Yeah, I see some ventilators over there. Absolutely. Um, so basically, ventilators. And what were the issues with ventilators? Give that some thought. If you want to put it in the chat, you can put it in the chat. I'm going to be looking at some responses. Um, Limit, ah, oh, wonderful, Muhammad. Uh, as you say, limited access, that is the primary one. So I'm going to list some of those um, issues that were particularly in the US and we were always following everything else. So in the US, the CDC, the Center for Disease Controls, usually has a stockpile of ventilators for emergencies and crises but there were not enough of them because nobody knew that there would be this many patients requiring ventilators. And even the, the individual states all over the US were fighting over the ventilators and there were like political battles over them and so on as to who gets the ventilators. And what happened was that the Defense Production Act was, um, you know, started and people like, and companies, car manufacturers like Ford, uh, GM, Tesla, and so on, uh, uh, they started manufacturing as did MIT. Um, so you see here, these are the new items of, uh, you know, uh, the car manufacturers and, and academic institutions developing new ventilators. So I ask again the question for you to give it a thought, which one of these names that you see here, 
Ford, GM, Tesla, which one of them would you trust? Whose reputation would you trust just from their name? GE, I have a response, GE. MIT, wonderful. Okay. And there were other people, GM and Tesla and MIT. Yeah, all of them trusted names. However, this is what happens in crises. And I want you to see the, uh, sorry, the next one. The Tesla ventilators. Tesla, led by Elon Musk, basically the people who are now going into space, into planets, uh, Mars, and so on, their ventilators were actually not ventilators. And if you see here, if you see here, California received about, I think, 10,000 ventilators from Elon Musk, from Tesla, and they were not ventilators. They were actually BiPAP and CPAP machines for much less severe patients. That is quite a disappointment, right? And what about MIT? MITs were also not ventilators that we received at the hospitals. They were actually, as you can see here, basically resuscitators or automated ambu bags. That is quite a disappointment. So why was this happening? As I say here, not all ventilators are alike. The key is that these are ICU ventilators. And ICU ventilators are different from even anesthesia ventilators used in the operating theater. Why was this all happening? We're going to look into that. We also, what was happening that with not enough ventilators, uh, people were testing multiple patient ventilation, that is a single ventilator ventilating more than one patient. Now, there are different uh, discussions on that. I personally, and in fact, even FDA did not uh, recommend that uh, for some obvious reasons. Another important thing was, as I should note here at the bottom, that training was an issue. Training was a huge issue. Retired doctors and medical personnel were being recruited, as were students still in their training. And I personally know of a, a student who was offered uh, to get into the ventilation business for ICU and all his student fees was being excused and so on, but he just left because he didn't feel confident to be in that position. So these are the main issues I wanted to point out about use of medical technologies, particularly in crises. Now, looking at uh, the hazards of medical technologies, I'll quickly flash, and you will have these slides to review later on. Uh, there were many issues in general, and they become even more important, uh, you know, healthcare crises. So Dr. Gerald Noble, also known as uh, the father of the Medical Device Act of FDA, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, just used to do food cosmetics until Dr. Gerald Noble actually introduced the Medical Device Act and they started regulating medical devices also. This is a famous quote that uh, Dr. Joel Noble and uh, uh, Robert Freeman, by the way, he was one of my mentors in Philadelphia. People may have heard of his organization, the ECRI or Emergency Care Research Institute. He said that the purpose of medicine is to prevent significant disease, to decrease pain, and even to postpone death. Technology has to support these goals, and if not, it may even be counterproductive, meaning that technology can kill. Technology that saves lives can kill as well, and these are the hazards. Back in, in the end of 2019, something very significant happened in the US. Um, the FDA opened a lot of hidden and secret reports on medical devices. So initially, it was, the estimates were that there are about 80,000 deaths and millions of injuries for medical devices over the past 10 years. But when these database was um, revealed, 
it actually went up to like 5.7 million medical device manufacturers. Um, these are some statistics, but even now, if you look at the last uh, thing that FDA is still allowing secret reports on medical devices, and that's not good. I list over here very quickly for your later on review that uh, these are the uh, causes, main causes of uh, medical device failures and some of the medical device recalls. In the medical device recalls at the bottom, you will see that about 40 million units are being recalled for West Pharmaceuticals. You will see some critical devices like pacemakers, defibrillators, and fusion pumps over here. You'll see some famous names over here, Abbott, uh, Care Fusion, uh, Cook, all of these, Medtronic, right? Hundreds of thousands and even millions of units being recalled in medical devices. So just want you to be aware of that. And there are various books that have been written on that. Okay. IT data science and epidemiology, um, also has like in IT, we know that storage management and sharing of electronic health records and in data science and epidemiology, basically um, the key characteristics of disease as well as predicting disease is being used. Under artificial intelligence uh, in machine learning um, and uh, deep learning technologies are used to predict the likelihood of infection and resourcing and extracting insights in real time. Time is important, particularly in crisis. So this is a study that was done for COVID patients on oxygen needs. There are various other studies as well. So I'm kind of going quickly through this so that we can get an idea. I know that later on, uh, I saw that there's somewhere, there's going to be a whole webinar on AI in health in, in healthcare. Uh, but I just want you to see that there are so many companies involved in that uh, all over the world. The evolution of artificial intelligence. Uh, brings me to these various timelines. And over here, you will see that back in 2017, um, it was a milestone in artificial intelligence when uh, Sophia, uh, the named human robot, was offered citizenship in Saudi Arabia. Um, there are many applications uh, in healthcare and uh, ro ro robot-assisted robot surgery. Uh, as well as virtual learning assistants are the leaders in these fields. I want to now move on to the fact that biotechnology, which was used a lot for, for example, for rapid development of the vaccine, uses computational biology, uh, different tools, but generally speaking, vaccine innovation, if you see the graph over here, let me point out that each one of these each one of these uh, different vaccines were developed over 10, 20, 40 years. Each one of these divisions is 10 years. So if you see the vaccine development generally takes, if, if you see a minimum 10 to 20 years and even more. However, what happened with the COVID-19 was much faster, uh, much faster vaccine development in less than a year. Uh, one can see uh, uh, the reason for that. There were various, uh, you know, uh, emergency use authorizations that were given for ventilators as well as different technologies by the FDA. So normally it takes 10 plus years. The minimum, uh, if you see there for different vaccines is 10 years. However, for um, the COVID-19, it took about 10 plus months, less than a year. So after mentioning all these different technologies, maybe that took a little more time. We have covered all these technologies. So I want to give you a thought. Is there anything else left from our key learning objectives? That is the training on these technologies. Keep in mind, all these technologies are good. They have the good, bad, and ugly uh, situations. But the, probably the ugliest situation is that there's not enough training in them. So the human resource development for training in these effective use of the technologies 
talks about the what, what are the knowledge, skills, and attitudes um, that are uh, that personnel need training in, the whom, which is uh, all of the people, and the when, as well as the how. Now, in each one of these, I want you to concentrate on the words that I have highlighted here, the adapted and safety one and safety two, which we will be talking about, as well as resilient principles and training everyone in different ways. We will be talking about refresher and reinforce training, as well as decision training in decision making which in the field of ventilation, and um, by the way, my, my PhD research topic was in high frequency ventilation. And for high frequency ventilation, I had to study a lot of conventional vent ventilation. And ventilation is the one device that requires a lot of decision-making. Another life-saving device like defibrillators, you know, you give it a shot for a few minutes, uh, increase, uh, you know, the output of the defibrillator and stuff. And if you're able to save it life, you can. But in ventilators, you do need decision-making skills as to when the patient gets better, because eventually the aim is to get them off the ventilator. Another quote that uh, the famous Ishikawa said was that quality control starts and ends with training. Okay, I want to now move on to healthcare crisis. What are the additional factors and what are the challenges when it is a healthcare crisis? So normally systems are designed for planned needs, either in a geographic area or for a certain population or a certain disease. However, what happens when these things change? or there's an unknown disease, like in the case of COVID-19, or there is a disaster, whether man-made or by nature, you know, cyclones, uh, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, and so on, or any man-made disaster, like in wars or something, there are huge casualties. So what happens at that time? Now, our recent experience has shown us that the way, the way this pandemic developed over time um, was a very sharp increase. You see an extremely sharp increase over here over time. And this is a over a matter of a few months, just a matter of a few months, what was happening that the cases, the number of cases were increasing and the number of deaths was rapidly increasing. So give it a thought, what happens in crises? What are the main issues? So several uh, agencies here in the U.S. were involved, the CDC, the White House, uh, the President's talk, uh, Task Force on that, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Authority, FDA, and, and uh, NIH uh, in particular. And NIH has a particular division, um, as mentioned here, NICHSR, which actually deals with healthcare technology issues as well. So with all these agencies involved, there is a big challenge of collaboration. And the World Health Organization was collaborating all over the world. Uh, I've just mentioned a few agencies over here that were involved in the US. So what we need in crises is a rapid response. And for that reason, um, and I'm sorry, going through um, some of the things that technologies that needed to de be developed rapidly were testing technologies, treating technologies, and prevention technologies. Testing technologies focused on diagnostics, treating technology on therapies, and preventive on uh, technologies on the vaccines to be developed. Under diagnostics, they were short-term and long-term. Um, and the same thing in, in uh, the therapeutic devices being um, uh, developed, as well as the preventive ones. So what I want you to focus over here is that it was very important. These were being done in various private and government uh, labs and, and research agencies and universities. But the important thing was and in each one of these, uh, I show a highlight molecular and 
point of care diagnostics, ICU, short-term and long-term stuff. But the key was that these things all need to be quickly manufactured, the time factor. And then they had to be delivered, the deployment factor um, in every one of these cases. So I actually came up with this, instead of RD, uh, sort of R&D, the RRDND, which is the rapid response development and deployment, the rollout of these technologies. So again, I draw your attention to the fact that in crises, rapid development of all these technologies is required. Um, I am now going on to the final subject. And uh, uh, can I have a time check here? Well, how are we doing in time? It's 8.31, you have enough time, just carry on. We are enjoying it very much. Okay, so now I'm getting to the main subject. That was all the build up towards resilient healthcare. Resilient healthcare, as we, we you know, how it developed over time. So we talk about system safety and patient safety in particular in healthcare. So how did was the progression of these different errors since the, I guess, uh, mid 50s, uh, early 60s and so on. So I have a graphical about that, that um, if we plot the system complexity versus the era over time, uh, um, initially like in the 60s or before that was the area of technology. There was a lot of technology being developed and the issue was hardware failures. There was an overlap and then came the study of the era of human errors up to the 80s, which included uh, variability in human performance of these technologies. Then the two were put together into the area, uh, into the era, sorry, of uh, social technical interactions, which is the mismatch between man and machine. So it was machine, the area of technology, um, man, the area of human errors and human performance, and then the connection between them, the social, how do men react with machines and how do machines react to what men do, or how they operate the machines. And then finally, uh, in the you know, uh, new millennium, so to say, the era of resilience engineering was developed. And I'll talk about how that came about, but it was designing an adaptable systems. Again, the key word here is adaptable. How do we adapt to changing situations like in crises? And I will be talking more about resilience, resilience engineering and resilient healthcare and how they are related. So again, uh, things went from technology to human errors to technology and human errors, the man machine, and then finally resilience engineering, which I'm going to explain going further. Okay, what is resilience? We will talk about that, which was a key learning objective under that. What is resilience engineering and what is resilient, resilient healthcare? So resilience is actually the capacity or ability to adapt to changing situations efficiently and effectively. So efficiently meaning over the time frame, uh, timely um, adapting or, or recovering from a situation and effectively meaning a positive result oriented. That is resilience. You can look it up in a dictionary and in various uh, you know, uh, resources. The word resilience is used in English. What is resilience engineering is actually the tools and strategies to focus on developing a system with an ability to sustain, and uh, have effective positive results in expected and unexpected conditions. Unexpected conditions, which is what we call about crises. So what is resilient healthcare? Well, resilient is healthcare is nothing but applying the tools and strategies developed in resilience engineering in healthcare activities and the concepts and methods of resilience engineering uh, in complex situations. I'm going to start to introduce some new concepts over here. So let me go back one step. 
Current safety aims to reduce the number of things that go wrong. We always talk about medical errors. So reducing medical errors, things that go wrong. The new concept developed by Dr. Eric Holnagel, whom I will introduce in some later slides, actually does quite the opposite. The resilient healthcare aims to increase the number of things that go right. So see the difference over here. You know, uh, the old concept was to reduce medical errors or things that go wrong, whereas resilient healthcare um, aims to increase the number of things that go right, the positive uh, patient outcomes. So with that picture in mind, I want to introduce an amazing person that I came to know about four years ago. Uh, Dr. Eric Holnigel. He has many titles. Look him up at erichollnigel.com. But the most amazing title he has, and I, it's the only one I know, that he's a senior professor of patient safety. I've never seen that. I had never seen that title until like four years before. Uh, and and he's, he's, by the way, a Dutch uh, from Denmark, a uh, Dutch national. Uh, but that is his title in the uh, university in Sweden. He also comes to a nearby um, uh, Livermore National Lab over here, um, just about half an hour from here, I mean, in Sandia. Uh, but enough about that. He introduced the following concepts, which we will be talking in a little later. The efficiency through trade-off, which is nothing but a strategy for resource management. He talked about safety one and safety two. This will come up again and again. Safety one was the old concept, reducing failure. Safety two is increasing success. The FRAM, functional resonance analysis method, which is modeling complex socio-technical systems that is the man-machine interaction. And there are tools for that that he developed. Uh, don't be overwhelmed by the term. I will be making a short introduction to it and inshallah have the opportunity to go into more detail at some later time. The resilience assessment grid, we will talk about that, the RAG, which is basically uh, in, in, in any situation, uh, learning to monitor, respond, learn and anticipate. And then resilience engineering, which is the ability of systems to succeed under varying conditions like crises. And then Resilient healthcare is nothing but the resilience engineering tools like FRAM um, and RAG uh, being applied to healthcare. <sighs> Amazing stuff. But just to give you a brief overview of this, uh, if you look at the safety one, safety two, which was uh, again a concept uh, introduced by Dr. Holnigel, um, that the safety one concept was basically. Uh, an old concept reducing failures and the safety two concept is increasing success. Said that a few times, it will come time and again. Here are some examples of from safety one and safety two. Uh, you also see that safety one is also called traditional patient safety, whereas uh, safety two is called the future of patient safety. That is not just reducing medical errors, but also adding on to it increasing um, and the positive outcomes. Again, just a few concepts. It's a real paradigm shift in safety thinking that he went about. The main factors in safety one are reducing errors, um, risk analysis, uh, focusing on the unsuccessful actions, whereas safety two is focusing on maintaining safety and increasing safety uh, on uh, looking at human variation and how and what is done under different limited resources. I don't want to go through all of this. This is an introductory material that you will get um, uh, in these two areas. So that's the one slide that I have to introduce to you or explain briefly. The resilience analysis grid is something, uh, again, a tool. So as I say, resilience engineering uh, Harnigal, Professor Harnigal introduced, proposed four abilities for resilient performance. Again, resilient, keep in mind, is adapting to changing or difficult situation. So he proposed four abilities of systems to perform resiliently. The ability to respond, 
which is knowing what to do in different situations, the ability to monitor different functions, knowing what to look for, what to monitor, like you know the different vital signs that are being monitored by medical devices. And then the ability to learn, which is very important. And it is of course aided by uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning and machine learning. The ability to learn is knowing what happened and learn from experience, particularly the learning the right lessons from the right experience. And the ability to anticipate. And to anticipate is to plan um, for changing situations. Um, anticipation that is planning ahead for what could happen. So uh, this is just a tool and it's if you see here, I'm, I'm representing how these four different abilities can be represented graphically. So I want you to follow my pointer on these. Now what's happening is that you're going on a scale of zero to 15, 15 being uh, a high uh, achievement, zero being a low achievement. So in this, if you graph the different procedures, by the way, there's a typo here, in terms of procedures, information, resources, the tasks, and the skills of an individual or the skills or ability of a machine. And you see in this, that this is like very high achieving in alternative tasks and you know, pretty, pretty good in, in skills and all these other fields. Uh, over here in monitoring, there are in fact like eight different things. And this is like a low achieving because it's all centered around that. So in this particular case, you have a high achieving response and learning ability, but a pretty low monitoring ability in this case. And anticipation is kind of like skewed over here. Um, it is very, very low as you see people who forecast. So this is towards the center, very low in that, pretty good that are raised, uh, information, staff development and skills and so on. So like I say, this slide just introduces to you what the resilience analysis grid is. You actually, what are the factors that can be anticipated and what is the performance in them? What are the things that can be learned and what are the performance of them? So if you see a blue line that's pretty much towards the periphery, of this uh, graphical uh, depiction, that means it is a high achieving one, right? And this one, as you see over here, uh, in the monitoring, it's pretty low achieving. So these are some concepts that I want to introduce, just the tools. So this was the resilience analysis, which is great. It is particularly used for measurement in emergency departments, which is kind of like a continual crisis happening over there. Now I want to introduce to you the other tool, which is the FRAM or the Functional Res Resonance Analysis Method. In this, it's a hexagon. There's different functions that we are going to talk about the six different factors that contribute to this function. Again, a concept introduced by Professor Eric Hallnickel. So what he starts with is six possible connected aspects, the input, that starts the function, the preconditions that are the conditions before the function, the resources that are needed for the function to carry out the function, the control, the C, which is the controls or regulation of the function, the time factor, which is how time affects the function. And this is any fun particular function. We look at some brief examples. And then finally, the output. So usually we all are used to thinking uh, about the input and the outputs to a function. That is, if you have an input, a certain function and an output, but there is the time factor, the preconditions and resources that are used for this function. So that is a tool that is used and how it is used. I'll give a brief um, a few examples of that. Um, again, concentrate input, function, output. But the additional four factors are the control of the function, 
the preconditions of the function, the resources that I use for the function, and the time factor, how it affects the function. Like in crisis, the time factor becomes extremely important. Okay, so here is an example if I want you to follow me uh, in the different things. And these are the four different functions that we talked about. The, the function of monitoring, responding, learning, and anticipating. And each one of these has these four factors. Besides the input and output, again, the time, control, preconditions, and resources. So what I see here is we start off with a function and we watch the process trends that is the input to the monitoring function, as well as interruptions that may happen to the function and how we respond to it. And then like if you're monitoring something, the output can go as alarmed to the respond function. That is, if you see an alarm you're monitoring, everything's going fine. If there is an alarm, then either the machine or the man responds. And then the responses help you to regain control. The, the output from the response also goes to the learning function as input to the learning function. And the output is lessons learned. And the lessons learned help you to anticipate function, which is the output as feedback to the priority areas that you decide to control. As an example, in a vital science monitor, you may be for a particular patient um, focusing on a particular vital sign. Now, this is the simplest form, a generic form that I have uh, uh, indicated over here. There can be many more um, different complicated functions and just to leave you how that is done, uh, you can see that in this example, which is applied to, uh, you'll see various functions over here for uh, somebody who's had a brain injury um, and needs to be anesthetized. So look at the functions over here, various functions, and it shows the interconnection of the input, output, control, um, preconditions, resources, and time function. So, you know, um, this is a paramedic hands over to the department starting over here. Uh, emergency department makes an assessment. The outputs go to different places. There is a function involving the neurosurgeon over here, um, displaying the blood results, which is feedback to, uh, you know, the output goes to the input of, of administrating some treatment. And finally, the the final function is preparing the patient for transfer and uh, if everything goes successfully. But these are various functions in each one of these hexagons and each one of them has inputs, outputs, preconditions, resources, and control. Um, these can get extremely complicated, but by the way, these are not hand done. There are tools developed for that. Um, this is another case for, uh, you uh, FRAM or functional resonance analysis method for uh, different functions being done here for intravenous infusion administration. And these can be color coded, uh, the, the red and the um, blue uh, color codes signifying particular things. Uh, well, I have, do have another example over here, which is from uh, controlling uh, DVTs uh, for enus, in enus in venous <laughs> insufficiencies. Okay. Um, patterns of resilience over how resilience, resilience engineering and patient safety are related. And then all these other factors tell you how these things are related. So I first highlighted safety issues that is safety one, safety two, safety management, health and safety management systems and so on. And then the engineering related ones that may be cognitive, cognitive uh, systems engineering, healthcare engineering, and so on. And so many other factors over here, you will see again, uh, and this is just like a word cloud and a word cloud with connections, uh, basically uh, to uh, see, and over here you see the socio-technical systems are involved also. Okay. 
um, I think we are I'm kind of nearing an end. I just want to give you a brief uh, kind of a summation. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic really uh, brought out the lack of preparedness and there were lessons learned um, from the handling of COVID-19. A few uh, article references over here that you can follow on. Uh, <clears throat> so, Dr. Eric, Dr. Eric Holnigl basically um, used resilience and then it's pretty much dedicated now, although he did a lot of work for other engineering uh, disciplines, but he's pretty much dedicated to healthcare now. Um, resilience, again, preventing failure, adapting uh, to different environments and preventing failure, resilience engineering, enhancing patient safety and improving patient outcomes. So these are some books that initially you see he wrote in the engineering, um, in the resilience engineering series, the safety one, safety two concept was the first one, and then four uh, volumes that he wrote on resilience engineering. Then he went on to the resilient healthcare series, uh, again, responding to emergency and crisis. Um, there were six books that he wrote on the series and I want to highlight each book has a title um, that focuses on different things. As you see here, volume three focuses on reconciling work as imagined and work as done. You know, uh, things don't happen uh, really as imagined uh, and you need to respond to that. He, he wrote an entire book on delivering uh, resilient healthcare and you see here, in uh, the resilient healthcare, let me draw your attention to that. Uh, basically, you see the respond, anticipate, uh, monitor, and learn functions over here, and that's where he came up with the uh, with the FRAM uh, tool. Uh, the fifth book he worked with was uh, working across boundaries, and this one recently in 2021 he wrote about resilient healthcare. Uh, muddling with a purpose. Now, he has many students who actually wrote, and I encourage you to uh, uh, look into that in detail. Uh, Dr. Braithwaite in Australia uh, and his team uh, wrote about uh, resilient healthcare organizations, resilient, uh, resilience in healthcare leadership, and for the staff, what happens when the going gets tough and really it got tough for everybody during uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I am concluding here just by reminding you that healthcare information technology, the concepts of total technology management and uh, the medical devices and healthcare technology all combine to uh, improve healthcare. It kind of, they all fall into place like a Tetris and all of them can combine these three factors to improve healthcare delivery performance. Um, these are things that you can see on my site, in particular, um, you know, the consultancy that I provide uh, various clients uh, in Aztec.us. Uh, this was fun for me. I hope it was for you. Um, any questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Najib. This was really informative. I enjoyed every second of it. This is, you know, I'm, I have learned a lot. Uh, we can just look at the chat and see if there is a, something that if, uh, you would like to shed some light on. Okay. Um, I see appreciations. Um, I'm quite sure you have a lot of lessons and, and you know, keep those questions coming even later, but if you have something immediately, um, I can address that. So there were a few questions that I posed along the way. Um, I hope you could see in particular, you know, I, I, would like to, I would like to have made this completely on resilient healthcare. Uh, you know, it's like days, I'm still learning, ma'am, from this professor, Hall, Eric Hallnick. Okay, so I remember yeah. that the, the, the World Health Organization 
has a tool to measure the readiness of the healthcare system to handle emergencies. Uh, I remember I, I have used it once, but uh, this was several years ago. Uh, do, you, can, do you recommend a simple tool uh, like we can use in order to have preliminary just overall assessment uh, of the overall readiness of our healthcare system and where are the main uh, problem areas? So, uh, Dr. Mustafa, uh, you bring a very, very interesting question actually to field over here. So let me address it in a different fashion. You know, my research was on ventilators, which I think are the most difficult devices to operate and function. And I always used to use this thing that operating a, a, a ventilator um, as compared to other medical devices is like flying a plane versus driving a car. You know, how difficult it is to fly a plane. But then I came across a biomedical engineer who was actually a pilot also. And he told me, you're wrong. It's easier to fly a plane than, than drive a car. Because if you drive like on the, on the Los Angeles freeway or something, it's crazy, man. And if you drive in Pakistan, it's even crazier. So I corrected that, that if you understand what you are using, then it is easier. Like for this person, he understood the tools that were in an airplane. I don't, I go into a cockpit and I don't understand what all those things are. So Dr. Freem, to answer your question, use anything that you understand. Because if you don't, you, if you don't understand something, then you cannot use it properly. Uh, Einstein once said that the formulation of a problem is more important than the solution. So if you need to understand whatever index, and by the way, I wanna mention again, if only we had a tool, a, a measurement tool, as an engineer, I think of it, oh, I can measure the temperature, I can measure the pressure and so on. But I cannot have a single tool to measure the readiness. So that has to be an estimate. That estimate can be done through any index, either the WHO resident, uh, uh, readiness tool or estimates uh, in a resilience analysis grade or the functional resonance analysis method. Um, I, don't, I hope I've answered your question. Yes, so Anything, you. there's so many choices out there, use anything that you understand. Thank you, this is a very nice advice that you know, we should uh, you know, learn from this advice and apply it in many fields in, in, in our life. It is 8.58, so we are sharp on time. It is, uh, we, are, uh, we have only two minutes left. So if you allow me, I will just take control of the share. Uh, uh, Dr. Mustafa? Yes. Can I just mention one quick thing? Please, please. Uh, I, was, uh, I was looking at Miles HPO and I was really glad to see all those key words that I have been talking about. <laughs> Yes. Um, you know, looking at the description of what is the target, what are the objectives of the HPHO, um, they very much agree with, uh, you know, the use of technology, preparedness, and so on and so forth. I saw like several keywords over there. So I feel, yeah. I feel good about this too. Thank you. Jazakumullah khair. And by the way, uh, uh, we will be organizing our upcoming high performance health organization. In, uh, th this would be the fifth edition, inshallah, on March 19th to March 24. So anybody who's interested in, the, you know, in attending this one week intensive training, we'll be very happy to, you know, we will share information with you and you can join us. By the way, Dr. Uh, Najib Asar will be one of the key speakers uh, in, during this event. And I am sure you will have more opportunity to learn from ex his extensive experience, inshallah. By the way, this will be the fifth time we are offering high performance health organization. We have organized it four times. We had the pleasure of having Dr. Najib Azhar with us in one of these uh, previous events. And these are samples of you know, sponsors and organization who participated with us in uh, previous uh, uh, events. So these are only samples of them. These are also samples of the speakers that we have invited in the previous editions of uh, 
high performance health organizations. Uh, this will conclude our, uh, our evening tonight. We hope you have enjoyed it. I have enjoyed it immensely myself. Dr. Najib will share with us the slides after introducing few enhancements and we will be happy to send you a PDF version by email to everybody who have signed up for this session. Also, you can uh, watch right now or share the video recording because it was broadcasted live on YouTube. So you have the link. If uh, Faisal, please share the link here, Faisal. Put the rabbit on YouTube. You can view it. Uh, within one day, we will do a little editing for it and the trim the unnecessary parts. So you will have a clear, a clean version of the YouTube recording as well. Dr. Najib, we, what time is it now in San Francisco? Um, it is 10 o'clock in the morning now. Oh, Greg, so we didn't wake you up early morning. So it's perfect timing for both us. So thank you again. We, and we look forward, inshallah, to see you in Medina in March in the High Performance Health Organization. I would like to thank all the participants who have you know, stayed with us throughout this full hour. And we look forward to, that you join with us, inshallah, in the upcoming events. We, you will be sent, you know, in a weekly basis, a announcement for the upcoming events. Thank you again. And we look forward, inshallah, to see you. And best regards, Dr. Najib. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.